Thank you, Aaron. So tonight we have the first in a series of presentations that kind of came up as some what water cooler talk with all the new hams that are that the club is producing as well as in the general community. We've decided to start a series of talks titled "On the Air," focusing on the practical aspects of amateur radio. Things like basic operation, things you can do in the world of amateur radio, ways to ease new amateur operators into the hobby and show them what can be done and what maybe can inspire them to do new things that maybe aren't traditionally done. So the first in this series of presentations will be about repeater operation, specifically related to ecom, and we're going to be talking about signaling methods, things beyond CTCSS. So with that, I would like to introduce our presenter, Aaron K6ABJ, to the stage. Thank you. Um, so yeah, tonight's repeater communication, and it's part of the on the air uh, new series that we're planning on doing. If for some reason you like this series, please let our president and vice president know. If um, you're not liking it, let us know all of that stuff. But it's really going to be geared towards expanding radio operator skills and to inspire, increase operator capability to get on the air. The ARRL does an on the air series of different things as well. Uh, and they have a magazine, a podcast, an email group, and um, some blog services. And so when we're brainstorming this series, we really felt like the getting on the air uh, was a good, um, uh-oh, oh, okay. So I'm gonna begin tonight by um, ensuring a solid understanding of some very basic uh, radio techniques. And then I'm gonna hopefully quickly move on to some new things for you guys to do uh, and that will, some of the more experienced hams will find things uh, uh, new information as well. So carrier squelch. This is a feature that most of us use, maybe not even really realizing what that we're using it, but that's your squelch dial. And what it does is it waits for a carrier, somebody to transmit, and as soon as somebody else transmits, they're basically sending a telecommand to your radio and telling it to unmute. So as long as the other signal is stronger than whatever, whatever level you have determined as the radio receiver, um, it will get through. There's also another feature called tone squelch. This feature is used a lot by repeater owners uh, in order to uh, mute the machine and prevent the machine from repeating uh, information that, or signals that were not intended for the machine. And so in order to, uh, so it just mutes the machine until somebody sends a, a continuously transmitted sub-audible tone that matches the tone that's been defined by that repeater owner. And so most of us have used this feature. If you've talked on, the, on a repeater, you most likely have sent it a, a PL tone in order to unmute that repeater. It's oftentimes called a PL tone. Um, it stands for private line tone. That is a trademark by Motorola. And so Motorola likes to um, use that term. A lot of us have adopted it, but there's also another term for it called CTCSS, which is what most of our radios call that uh, tone, um, which stands for Continuous Tone Coded Squelch System. It's a sub-audible tone, somewhere between 67 and 257 hertz. I believe there's 54 tones there in the, the group, and uh, those aren't actually sub-audible tones. The human ear is actually able to hear those tones. The human ear typically can hear a tone down as low as 20 hertz. And if the older radios, with some of them, you could actually hear those tones uh, because they don't have the filtering that are specifically designed to filter those out. It also takes a pretty good speaker, so you have to have a decent quality speaker in order to uh, hear those tones. 
Um, so, yes, despite what Motorola claims, there's actually no privacy involved in these tones. Um, in fact, it actually is going to do the opposite because, as we already discussed, that CTCSS tone is sending a telecommand to another radio that's receiving that signal and telling it to unmute so it can hear whatever you have to say. So some practical applications for this, um, this material. Here's the, the basic repeater. We've already talked about this. On the right-hand side is the receiving, antenna, rec the receiving handy talkie, and it's got carrier squelch in, on it, so it's not waiting for any specific tone. It's just waiting for a strong enough signal to tell it to unmute its speaker. And then the speaker, the HT on the left is sending the, the PL tone, and then the repeater at the top, it's got a, what's called a tone squelch feature. So it's waiting for that tone in order to unsquelch itself. Here are antennas. As hams, we always like to look at antennas. Um, so the, the one on the left is in Sedona. It's on uh, Soldier Pass Road. And then the one in the middle is right around here. It's down in Walnut Grove, about 28 miles south of town. And it is the third largest structure in the United States, up at 2,000 feet, 2,049 feet, uh, quite the elevation. Um, it's used by a number of different uh, TV stations and uh, radio stations. Uh, you can't really get anything 2,050 feet. It's not really allowed. That's why it's 49. Um, but even at that, it takes a lot of special um, uh, permissions to get something that tall. And most of these things that are built end up falling down. They're just not very uh, structurally uh, sound to be able to deal with them. Oh, there was the other one up here on the top right. Um, that one obviously is the neighbor that, um, that uh, you apparently... If you don't like your neighbors, it's okay. Um, but if you uh, want to have relations with them, uh, probably good luck. So what I want to do here is use these three different pictures as a substitute for a repeater. And uh, the, they all are going to uh, represent an actual repeater. Um, but I figured these were more interesting than using a picture of a repeater, except for the, the middle one, that actually is a repeater site, and there is a ham radio repeater on it. Uh, it's, the, it's a DMR repeater, and uh, it's up there tall. It's a very wor good working repeater, but you do have to have a DMR digital radio to do it. So the W6YDD repeater system is a system of repeaters, three different repeaters. And th the one on the left, we will say, is in, on Wolf Mountain in Gra Grass Valley. The repeater on the right, for the sake of tonight's conversation, we will say is on Mount Vaca. And then the repeater in the middle, we will say, is in Georgetown on Bald Mountain. A lot of times here in Sacramento, you can hear all three of these repeaters simultaneously because they all use the same frequency, 146.625. So the repeaters, in order for them to know which one you're trying to talk to, you have to send a, t a PL tone that's specific to that repeater. And then it will unmute and repeat whatever signal you're trying to send to it. So for Mount Va Mount Vaca, it is um, a PL tone of 100. Mount oh, Wolf Mountain is a PL tone of 151.4. And then Bald Mountain is a PL tone of 123. And if you're listening um, on 146.625, as I said, you can probably hear all of these repeaters, but you're only going to hear probably one of them at a time. And they're going to ID themselves so that you know which repeater you're actually listening to. Uh, and so at the end of whoever's transmitting, at the end of their transmission, they are going to release their PTT button and the repeater will come back and play one to three tones indicating which repeater it is. So the one on Wolf Mountain is known as tone one. 
the one on Bald Mountain is known as Tone 3, and the one on Mount Vaca is Tone 3, having nothing to do with the actual tones that are being sent. Okay, um, let's see here. So your radio can not only transmit PL tones, it can also receive and decipher uh, tones. So you can use Tone Squelch on it as well. And there's a number of different reasons to do that. Uh, maybe you want to eliminate some noise yourself. You're getting some sort of other interference. Um, but the re club repeater doesn't pass the PL tone through. There are some repeaters that whatever repeater tone it hears, it will pass that one through so that the person listening could also select and use that um, tone. Am I incorrect? Oh. Okay, so it does transmit it, the 162.2. And it is possible for it to be configured probably for it to send a different tone, but it's sending the same tone. So just be aware that you can use multiple tones for different purposes. Um, a couple other key things on this, maybe I don't wanna hear all the radio chatter. I might wanna make my wife happy, uh, and so I'll set a repeater of radio in my kitchen and then I'll tell my buddies, hey, you know, if you want to uh, uh, get through to me, uh, send this PL tone and it may not work though on our repeater. Um, yeah. Okay, so it would strip off that tone that you sent it. Um, but you still obviously have to send the original tone for that the repeater is looking for. But that would work for simplex if you're in range of a friend or a relative or something like that. You could set that PL tone squelch on your radio. Um, it would, could also be set up to do an alert. Maybe the club or Aries or somebody else wanted to be able to alert all of its members that the club meeting, the club uh, TechNet is on tonight, or there is an emergency that's happened. Uh, we could send out an emergency, an, a tone, a CTCSS tone, instructing all of the club members' radios to unmute. So there's lots of different uses um, for these various features. Um, when you go to program your radio, there are basically two settings. One, you have to tell it what type of tone mode you want to use, and then you have to also tell it what tone. And so there's a chart again of all of the different tones. And uh, looking at the tone squelch type, off is if you don't want to send any tones or you don't want to have your, your radio uh, squelched because of a tone. Uh, and then tone, the tone feature is usually if you're just trying to transmit out a tone and you're gonna use carrier squelch to receive. And then there's the squelch feature that will listen for a tone, um, which may or may not actually also send out a tone. It depends on your radio. The radios use all kinds of different terminology for these features, and it makes it really fun to try to figure out. <laughs> so this is a great thing to play with, experiment with, get your mobile out and set it, and then get your HT and try to unmute your, your, H, your mobile and try not to do this through the repeater. Do your experimenting between your HT and your mobile because it might take a little bit, as Jim and I know. Um, there's also some other um, modes that you can choose, and I've kind of put those in a, a brown, lower contrast thing uh, because I'm not going to get into those right now, but we will get into those a little bit later. Uh, so that's a DCS and color code. So here's three different Motorola, I mean, I don't know if they're Motorola, but they're blister pack radios is what I like to call them. Um, and regardless of what the, the radio actually says on the radio in terms of what channel it's on, we're gonna pretend for the sake of this discussion that it is they're all on channel 22 and all of these are in one talk group. So the people that all are, have these radios, they all want to hear what the other person is saying. 
Um, there might be other people, if you show up at Disneyland, uh, there probably be other families that are using these same radios, maybe even operating on the same, um, the same channel as you. So you might want to use a CTCSS tone or a private tone in order to, to mute those other calls out. So these three individuals have tried to program their radios. The one on the left is using a PL tone of 162.2. He's using that as an encoded tone. So he's gonna be transmitting that one out and he's gonna be using carrier squelch. The pink phone on the right is using both a encode and a DC code, a, a decode. So it's listening for a code. So it's encoding and transmitting 162.2 and then it's decoding and listening for 114.8. And then the one in the middle, it's on squelch. It's not sending out any tones, but it's listening for 162.2. So if the, the red radio there was to transmit, which of the other ones would hear it? I heard of both. Okay. So that's the one that is the pink one would actually not hear that because it's trying to decode and listen for 114.8. And the, the red phone is transmitting a PL tone of 162.2. So it's actually sending the wrong code. Um, but the yellow one is going to hear that. So if the yellow phone was to transmit, which ones would hear it? Uh, the red one, yes. The red one would be the only one to hear it because it has no tone squelch set up. It's just using the carrier squelch feature. So even though it has a PL tone configured, remember it's only transmitting that one. The, the pink one uh, is listening for 114.8. And again, that, uh, the yellow one is not sending that tone. So it's not going to hear it. Is that correct? Did I say that right? This can get very confusing, which is why you um, do a, run a bunch of tests yourself. Oh, I didn't do the other one. I was going to do the other one too. But um, So here we have three different talk groups, three different groups of friends uh, that want to talk with each other, um, but they are all operating on the same frequency of 444.5 megahertz. They all are using the tone squelch feature so they're all, all broadcasting a tone and they're all listening for a tone, but they're all using different tones. So talk group one on the left is using 123. Talk group right on the right is using 146.2 and talk group number three is using 67. So they're actually not gonna hear each other. None of them are gonna hear each other even though they're using the same frequency unless one of them was to trans both transmit at the same time. And then they're going to cause interference uh, with each other. And then you'll realize, hey, I'm causing problems to somebody else. But if there was somebody without a, a tone squelch on theirs, they weren't using a PL tone, they would hear everything because these are not actually private tones. <laughs> they create no privacy. You have a question? Yes. One thing you have to make sure of, if you are using tone on your receiver, that you monitor before you transmit. There has to be a way to defeat that tone. And look, saying, oh, I always look at the little light on my radio. People don't. You have to have a way to disable it. Otherwise, you should not be using it on an amateur radio. And you really, you shouldn't even be using it on your blister pack radio. Um, so there, your radios have a monitor feature. We, most of us never use it or we don't know what it's for. And this is what it's for here. If you have other groups, talk groups in using your frequency, you want to first monitor that frequency. It's actually, we do it subconsciously if we're using HF um, because we want to stop and listen on that, that frequency before we immediately start occupying it. Uh, and uh, sometimes we'll even do it on simplex frequencies too. If I'm looking for a frequency that I'm going to use for a long time or, or do something like that, I might use that monitor feature. Um, listen, listen, listen is what they always say. Um, but again, so none of these things actually provide any, um, 
any privacy. Um, okay. So let's get into a little bit about public safety here. Uh, so we talked about talk groups. There's also a conventional system and a trunked system that a lot of uh, public safety agencies use. And so we're going to first talk about the, the diagram there on the left, which is a conventional system. On the conventional system, um, the red circles are indicated as repeaters, each being on a different frequency. So each one of those is going to be able to um, handle a different talk group. And there are three different talk groups um, that are assigned to use the first repeater there on the left. And so just like those other, that circle and square and uh, triangle, I have to get my shapes right. Just like those diagrams had three different talk groups on the same frequency, that's the same thing that's happening here on the left-hand side. So out of those three talk groups, each one of those talk groups is represented by a yellow cream-colored circle. So out of those, one of the talk groups has decided to transmit. They've hit their PTT button, and so they've been moved up to be served at the service counter by the, the, the radio, the repeater. The other two in the back um, are just listening. Nobody on those talk groups are doing any. They're just listening. The second one, same thing is going on. If you move over one column here to the right, uh, right there, um, it's the same as over here. We've got two talk groups that are doing nothing and one that is transmitting currently on the repeater. In the third column here, we have nobody currently transmitting and using that repeater. All three of these are down, the three talk groups, none of them are currently transmitting. So in the fourth column here, we have three different people that are keying up their their mics at the same time, hitting PTT button. That rapport repeater at the top is only able to hear one of those th signals. So obviously, hope, maybe one of those is the other. Maybe they've hit their monitor button to realize that the others want to speak first. So maybe they're waiting in line and maybe they're transmitting over each other. But in either event, though, that repeater system has a problem. And then in the next two um, repeaters there, these two repeaters are empty. They're not being used. So in this conventional system, it's really doing a, a pretty poor job in meeting the needs of those repeaters because not all of these, uh, these talk groups are getting served, even though there's three repeaters that are available. Keep in mind that on, um, in ham radio, we like to say we don't have many frequencies available, but we really have a lot of repeaters out there to choose from. And most of those repeater owners have no problem letting anybody use their repeaters, certainly around here, um, as long as there's not some special event or something like that happening um, on like a Saturday morning or something that has exclusive use for that repeater uh, and need for priority traffic. Um, but especially in the safe public safety realm, you not only have fire and police, you have road maintenance crews, you have the trash um, pickup crews, you have PG&E, you have all of these different agencies that are trying to share resources, a limited resource. Uh, and even as hams, we, you know, sometimes we too struggle with the limited resource and finding, and we'll step on um, each other. So in the right-hand side here, we have what's called a trunked system. And this system has been around for a number of years now. Some of our older hams, um, this is really elementary for them because they were a ham when that you were, they were a ham before I was born. So they've seen some of this technology evolve over time. And so they're quite familiar with it, where some of us newer hams have never heard of this technology or don't know exactly what it is. So in a trunked system, you have the same six repeaters. You actually have, are able to have more users. I've put down 32 different talk groups here. 
that might be a little excessive. You might have to add another repeater or two to provide adequate service. But at this moment in time, this system is meeting the needs. Um, there, there's, uh, what, five talk groups that are trying to transmit, and these two that are waiting in line, the, the computer, this dynamic computer, is going to dynamically assign um, and control which, uh, which counter they go to. And this happens in instant time. So as soon as I hit my PTT button, the computer's gonna come back and tell my, re my radio, move to frequency number four. And my radio will immediately start transmitting on frequency number four. Not only that, that repeater is also going to send out a PL tone to all of the other um, radio operators in my talk group, telling the my talk group um, radios to unmute their their uh, radios. So. All of my listeners, not only am I as a transmitter jumping around, but all of my listeners are also going to jump around between the frequencies. So if you're trying to do scanning, you might hear one, if you're on a frequency, you might hear one side of the conversation because the, the repeater controller um, could have assigned the first time I hit the PTT button to, you know, this repeater over uh, somewhere here. There it is. Um, it might assign me to one repeater, but the, whoever responds to my QSO, uh, my call, might be assigned to another one. So we're doing a lot of frequency hopping here, and it all happens without the operator even being aware that it's happening. Uh, so you can have a lot more people in the system uh, because it just jumps to whatever uh, radio is currently needed. There's also a term called multiplexing. There's a number of different, well, three different ways, um, essentially, of multiplexing. And this is a way of combining multiple signals uh, on to one. So on this drawing here, we have three different radios, three different transmitters, all transmitting simultaneously. It's going to go in here into the, mul the multiplexer, otherwise known as a MUX. And then it's going to combine those four signals into one signal. And then on the other side is the demultiplexing device. And it's going to take those four signals and then separate them back out. So there's four receiving antennas or radios that can hear those four signals. The way this happens is that it's, this is done by time multiplexing or time division multiplexing. So as you can see, the first ray transmitter is going to get the first slot, and then C, and then B, and then A, and then it's going to repeat itself again, D, C, B, A. And these are really small digital packets of about 8 bits or 16 bits, something like that, I don't know. Um, and so you're, even though it's alternating very quickly between different pieces of information and packets, as a listener, we're not really hearing much of that, if any. Now, this is what DMR uses, the um, digital um, radios that use DMR. Uh, it uses this time division multiplexing. And it actually doesn't have four channels. It could only accommodate two um, conversations simultaneously. So even though I have uh, four listed here, it's, it's really uh, two. Um, in DMR, since I'm on DMR, I'm just going to continue this. DMR uses what's called color codes instead of CTCSS tones. They basically perform the same function. It's just another term and another set of codes. These codes are co color code 0 through color code 15. When you're programming these radios, so that's going to tell when you send, use a color code, you're either sending or receiving a code telling your um, something to unmute. There's also a talk group setting. So we've already talked about talk groups. So you will specify to your radio which talk group you want to listen to. So even though you're listening to a certain um, one of these here, it's only going to, the repeater's only going to unmute your radio if you, someone in your talk group somewhere in the country is pushing their PTT button. 
So you can actually make direct calls. So we could have our own little DMR group if we wanted to and um, have exclusive, uh, you know, non-private conversations because they are not encrypted. Um, all of the DMR stuff is all publicly published information. So there is no encryption in this. Uh, there's another thing you have to specify in your, your tell, tell your radio, which is I want TS1 or TS2, which refers to the time slot. So do I want to be listening to the traffic on time slot one, or do I want to transmit and receive on time slot two? So that DMR repeater at uh, 2,049 feet in Walnut Grove can actually accommodate two simultaneous conversations. And if you're on the wrong time, slot, you're not going to hear the other one. Um, another thing that's interesting about DMR is although there's two time slots, that time slot actually, those two time slots take up 12.5 kilohertz, which is a narrow FM signal. Um, most of the signals we use or are using are FM uh, wideband, which is a 25 kilohertz signal. Um, ham radio operators are one of the few uh, services out there that have been allowed to continue to transmit on wideband. We can still use narrowband, but we're encouraged to use uh, wideband. So as ham radio operators, we typically use 25 kilohertz. A lot of the public service agencies have been told by the feds and the FCC that you need to go down to a narrow band and only take up 12 and a half kilohertz of space for your transmission. Um, so in actuality, we are getting four different signals out of the same uh, bandwidth that we could op occupy with a typical... Um, a typical transmission. Um, there's two other types of multiplexing. This one um, also has, it has three on the left and three on the right. It can be any number really of uh, channels. I don't know that there's a limit, but again, you have the multiplexer on the left and you have the demultiplexer on the right. The difference here is they're not time sequenced. They're kind of stacked up next to each other. So they're going to end up occupying more bandwidth than what a single signal would do. But by um, this multiplexer pushing these things through as one signal, it is actually going to occupy less, uh, less bandwidth, um, less, less frequency uh, than if there were three separate transmitters in there. There's a third one here which if you look at it closely is pretty much identical to the one up above. The only real difference with this one is, so the top one is used by TV, AM, FM broadcasting, some other uses. This one's called frequency division multiplexing, whereas this one down below is called wavelength division multiplexing. This one is done using fiber optics and optical signals, whereas the one up on top uses uh, frequency, uh, frequency division multiplexing. Okay, so there's also um, DCS. DCS, or digitally coded sequence, you may have seen this on your radio, may probably have not even used it. Um, this is the modern equivalent to CTCSS. It pretty much performs the identical same function. It's going to send a signal to the other radio and tell it to unmute its speaker so that it will hear you. It the, uses a different code system. These are some of the DCS codes. There's 104 listed here, so about twice as many um, DCS codes as CTCSS codes to choose from. So if I'm sitting in my kitchen with my radio and I want my buddies to be able to unmute my speaker, I might choose what DCS tone instead of a CTCSS tone, making it more difficult for other hams to guess which one I'm using. Um, there's actually a total of 512 possible DCS tones out there. 
Most of those are not going to work for our purposes, though. So a lot of them have been eliminated from what we use. Um, there is no standard list, zero standard lists for this system. That's part, one of the part, potential problems with this system. Um, so you have to choose a list that's safe. You have to figure out what list do you think most of the other lists are going to be using and then choose a code from that list. Most of those are going to have somewhere between 83 uh, and 104 possible codes to choose from. And there's a pretty good chance that if you choose one of those, the other radios are going to be able to use that same code. Because a lot of those other ones, as I said, just they're not going to really function for what and meet our needs. Another problem with the DCS system is that they have all these other names. I thought PL tone and C TCSS was difficult. Well, there's also CDCSS, which is Continuous Digital Code Squelch System, or the Digital Private Line, which of course is Motorola, which is anything but private. Then there's the Digital Tone Squelch System, which is what ICOM refers to these cones as, and it's a DTCS. And then General Electric likes to use the term digital channel guard, DCG. But they're all pretty much using the same codes, um, and most of them are even going to be the same if you're choosing from one of those safe tones. Um, there is an advantage to this um, and this system, and that is the way up here in this chart works. So these digital codes, um, here's a digital code right here. This digital code is just ones and zeros. So it's either up or down for off, on or off. And each, the, the time sequence is the same. The spacing between these codes of being on or off are identical. Over here, we're looking at one of these DCS codes. And the spacing is the same. So we can see that maybe there's three or four on one off, three on, four off, three on, eight on, one on, and so on. And that code, or word as they like to call it, to represent these numbers, um, will just repeat itself. The whole time you're holding down your PTT button and transmitting, that sub-audible tone will be sending out that code and repeating it so that the other, the other radio that's listening for that will unmute its speaker. So as soon as you hit the PTT button up here, your radio is going to transmit as long as you're talking. And then right here, you're going to let go of your PTT button, and you're going to stop talking. And normally, when you let go of your PTT button, your radio stops transmitting. But that's not what happens with DCC. With DCC, it's going to continue to transmit for 180 milliseconds. During that 180 milliseconds, it's going to send this on-off code. Before that, while you're sending the PTT button, it's sending a modulation of the code. The reason being is during this last, it's saying 200 milliseconds, but it's really 108, um, 180. The re what happens here is the transmitting radio is telling the receiving radio to unmute its, I mean, to mute its mic. So initially, the DCC code over here, the transmitting radio is saying to the receiving radio, unmute your speaker. Over here, the transmitting radio is telling the receiving radio to mute your speaker. The advantage to this is that the receiving radio will immediately um, silence its speaker. So you end up uh, getting rid of that annoying uh, squelch tail, yes. This system did have some problems years ago um, because a lot of the new radios didn't offer it. There's a lot more analog radios out there that will do um, a PL tone. Uh, so my guess is years ago, repeater owners were like, no, we're not going to do this. Our PL tones work just fine. But Jim did discover this um, pretty neat feature of the DCS. There's some other pros and cons to how effective it is and how well it works. I wasn't able to determine if the benefits outweigh the costs, which is better um, by the descriptions of them. 
So anyways, there's that, the DCS system, just another thing to play with. Okay, this is the way you can do cross-band repeating. Um, instead of using a typical repeater that costs lots of money, you can use your mobile radio and most modern radios that have, well, the, the higher end mobile radios have this capability. Um, this is the way Jim has a crossband at his house that he's doing it. He's doing what's called a one-way crossband. And so, uh, let's see here. We're going to start at the repeater up here. And this repeater is going to be transmitting. We're going to follow it across the blue line across over to the HT. The HT is going to be receiving the frequency that the repeater's transmitting. Um, because the, trans, the repeater is using a lot of power, it is high up, the HT prop may be more successful at hearing it, uh, hearing the repeater, than the repeater is going to be able to hear the HT, if that makes sense. Um, so anyway, the, this HT is able to hear it. Then what Jim does was when he presses the PTT button on his HT, his HT follows the red lines and the boxes over to his mobile. And his, his HT is using a PL tone, or actually he's using the DCS system. So his HT is transmitting on the 70 centimeter band using a DCS tone of 212. And then the mobile rig that he has is listening to that on 70 centimeters. It's on DCS squelch, listening to the same code or for the same code. It unmutes and then it uses its better um, superior antenna and power than the HT had. And so it's able to get to that repeater. So he's able to have a lot more optimal um, use. He's using the DCS system, which prevents interference. If he was not in using a DSO, DS, DCS code right here, this mobile rig could be picking up, um, you know, if he was just using carrier squelch, this mobile rig could unmute, picking up somebody else's transmission or noise and accidentally transmitting to the transceiver. So if you're doing this, it's really important that you use a PL tone here or a DCS tone uh, to avoid that. This is the typical crossband repeating. This is the way I had set my radio up in my car. Uh, I'm not going to go into all of this too much, but if you're at home or later you're watching a YouTube video, you can pause it here and study this if you want or look at it at other times. Um, but it's pretty involved. It's basically two-way um, crossbanding. So if we start out uh, up here, the, the repeater is transmitting. It's doing cross banding over here to 70 centimeters. This is in VHF. Communication over here is in UHF. Um, so it's going here from the blue down, and then it's going to hear it over there. And then when this one hits the PTT button, it's going to come back. And on there is all the different codes and things. And you could really find any good um, simplex frequency to do this on, um, or and. Uh, choose any DCS codes or PL tones of your choosing. But again, use that monitor feature to get permission. Uh, make sure nobody else is using that frequency because you're going to do a lot of, of transmitting on that. You also want to turn the power on your mobile radio down because it's going to be transmitting everything that the repeat, all the traffic on the repeater. So every time everybody is speaking, it's pretty much a, a full duty cycle. And your radios are just not set up to be able to do that. So turn down the, the power, which is really quite good too, because when you turn down the power, um, your signal's not going to be going out as far. You're using your HT, you're going to be near within your mobile rig. I also use this because I want to be sitting in the, the living room. So I'll have my HT sitting in the living room with me, with my Bluetooth going from my HT to my ear. And my HT is going over into the office on the mobile rig, which is talking to the repeater. So I've got, you know, all that power um, and no noise for the wife to listen to. <laughs> 
So here's some other things, um, just some resources. I had promised that this was going to be, had some MCOM, and I just didn't end up with as much as I was hoping for. So I'm going to throw in a little bit more MCOM stuff here. Um, here's some ARIES resources. If you go to the groups.io files area, you will find some good information. And again, this is a good spot to either take a photo or pause the YouTube video later, um, or just go out there and search. But there's an ICS-205 radio comms plan out there, which has a list of the re radio frequencies and repeaters that Ares uses. Um, that is their comm plan. So it'd be a good thing to program your radio with. I know a lot of us, is, we just have two channels in our radio, one for the club repeater and one for the simplex frequency. Maybe that's it. So program in some other stuff, because if you're wanting to do the MCOM, you really need to be um, interoperable. You need to have a lot of different frequencies available to you. So if somebody else tells you to turn somewhere, you're able to do it. Um, they also have another comp plan out there. I'm not sure why there's two, but there's also the Placer County Aries frequencies. And then there's a no repeater procedure. So if the club repeater was to go down, what you would do in that case. Um, and one last slide here is, um, so program your radio with more stuff. Here are some more sites that you could go to and more ideas for repeaters that you could um, program into your radio uh, to do. And, um, oh, your radio has one more signal link feature, one more telecommand feature, and that's called DTMF. All DTMF is, is the same thing as the touch tone buttons on your phone. It uses the identical same uh, tones. And DTMF, if you press your buttons on your radio, those are the DTMF bo buttons. Uh, they are audible, you're going to hear them. And... Um, Okay. Anyways, those are there, um, and they're available. You can do research on those um, to learn more. There's lots of good information on that. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. That was very informative.